It's my pleasure to welcome this morning Karel Leuven for the keynote, President of the European Open Science Cloud Association. Uh, Karel was a professor or in biochemical engineering at the Delft uh, University of Technology. He served as a dean of the Faculty of Applied Science for almost 12 years and was the rector magnificus of Delft University of Technology from to, uh, 2010 to 2018. He mainly works of, uh, on open science. He was uh, the chairman of the task force open science of uh, CESAR the Conference of European Schools for Advanced Engineering Education and Research, and was the chairman of the executive board of European Open Science Cloud. He is now the president of the European Open Science Cloud Association. I had the pleasure uh, to meet Karel virtually many times in 2020 when we were wo uh, working on the SRIA, the Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda for EOSC, and I'm so happy to see him for real. I met him yesterday evening for the first time in person at uh, the, the conference reception. So we are happy to uh, be able to listen to him uh, speaking about European Open Science Cloud, the road ahead. So Karel, the floor is yours. I hope my mic works. Apparently it does. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Jeanette. And uh, we did not even see each other last night. We even danced some time on the dance floor. So that was a good start of this conference. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. Uh, I noticed that there's a lot of people I do not know. There's a few people I do know, uh, which is a good sign because uh, I think the connection between the libraries and what we call the European Open Science Cloud, and I'll try and explain to you what it is, uh, that that connection is an important one. But let me start with my dream. Suppose I type in in uh, the uh, Google search engine, Delft University of Technology, then I get something like 35 million hits uh, with the Delft University on top, not difficult to find and not difficult to find information uh, about it. Or if I would like to find this library here, I type in the Southern University of Denmark library and immediately, oh, sorry, there it is. Uh, and I can even have directions uh, in Google Maps in a split second. Why can I not find the same material I need as a researcher? I've been working on the drying of gelatin together with PhD students. So I type in data set for the drying of gelatin because I would like to know the temperature dependence, the concentration dependence of the drying behavior and of the diffusivities of water in that material. Well, I find beautiful articles uh, with that search uh, again in Google, but you can use other search engines, of course, using libraries. And if I then look in the article, I find beautiful, colorful pictures, but no data. I cannot read the data from that article. There's no link to the data in this particular article and in most articles. So wouldn't it be nice if we as researchers could find a data set as easy as we can find the library here in Google Maps? And there is no technical reason why this should not be possible. There's two reasons why it is not possible. The data sets are not out there in uh, the World Wide Web to be found. And secondly, the technology does not exist to approach them, to have the metadata with them, or at least if the technology exists, a lot of the metadata are missing. Basically, this is what we aim for with the European Open Science Cloud, making it possible, but then worldwide to do this uh, for researchers to as easily find data. I'll come back to that at the end of my presentation. Where is the development of the European Open Science Cloud position? Then I usually use the definition of open science we have in the Netherlands. That is towards open access, towards fair data, and embedding citizen science in the system. But this is not going by itself. But this should bring us for, from science as it is to science as it will be. And what we need for that is rewards and recognition systems to change. We need support and training, data stewards, support of libraries, support of ICT departments, community engagement. The community is important. If they don't see this, then it's not going to happen, like with the World Wide Web itself. Infrastructures, of course. We do have a lot of infrastructures, e-infrastructures, and I'll come back to that in a second. And policies and regulations in order to get going. This transition 
I guess will take another 20 years from now. So don't think we'll do this tomorrow and we'll solve this tomorrow. Yes, we go step by step. So tomorrow we will have more than today and the day after tomorrow we will have more than tomorrow, but we will not be there in a couple of years. So this is a, a worldwide transition as far as I'm concerned, and that needs engagement, coordination, support in order to make that transition. For me, open science is more of a transition than the end goal, because at the end we will just call it science. Difference between open and fair data, an extremely important discussion, because a lot of people still confuse uh, that everything should be open data, not everything should not be open data, there should be fair data. Data that are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. These are the four main principles, but there are 15 principles below that for the data and the metadata described in an article in 2016. Uh, it's important to understand that, and if we do not work in that direction, which is now worldwide accepted as a direction, it's not gonna work. But of course, what we want is if we have publicly funded research to be as much of the data as well fair as open. So data can perfectly be fair, but not need not to be open. I'll come back to that in a second. So data should be as fair as possible, step one, and as open as possible. But some data cannot be open for security reasons, for privacy reasons, for good reasons, not to make them open to everybody. And open doesn't mean open to everybody. I'll come back to that in a second also. What is fair? Well, we know the definition, I just gave it. And this also comes from a, a publication of the Commission Expert Group driving these two circles towards each other. So fair is not open. It doesn't mean it's closed. There's a lot in between open and closed. It can be open for certain parties and not for others. It ensures the data can be found, understood and reused. That's what the principles are for. And data can be shared under restrictions. In other words, as open as possible and not as closed as necessary, but as restricted as necessary. By using the word closed, it also sounds like it's closed for everybody. And that is not meant, it should be restricted. If I say data, I mean classical uh, form of data, I mean publications and I mean software. So all the digital objects coming from research. That is what I mean if I use the word data. And this is very often not understood again. And therefore we have to emphasize that. And maybe we should mention the other things separately. What is the grand vision of the European Commission? The grand vision for this European open science cloud ecosystem, by the way, all four words are wrong. This is not gonna be in a European system, it needs to be a worldwide system. It's not about open science, it's about fair data. And it's definitely not a cloud, it's going to be a commons, a federated system. So apart from all four words being wrong and trying to kill this term, we have to live with this and therefore we use the acronym EOSC then uh, we don't talk about the European Open Science Cloud anymore. We call it EOSC. So what, what, what the, the grand vision of the commission is, is to reduce the fragmentation, to give Europe a global lead, to enable interdisciplinarity, to, et cetera. A lot of these things you can read on this slide, uh, a, a very broad and grand vision, which takes much more than only creating the European so Open Science Cloud. And what we emphasize in the European Open Science Cloud Association is to build the web of fair data. Like the World Wide Web of Pages is running on the internet, the World Wide Web of Fair Data should be running on the internet as well and should be searchable, findable, and uh, deliver reusable data. And again, it says including publications and software. I estimate that 10 years from now, many of the publications will be metadata with the data rather than data with the publication. In many cases, I assume in the longer run, not for all the disciplines, not everywhere, but that publications will be metadata that come with the data. What is this web of scientific insight as it was called by Ursula von der Leyen in her Davos lecture last year? It's a web of fair data, as I said, and the related service on these data. If we look at the World Wide Web for the pages, then the services has come from the private sectors and from other sectors. The services will come on top of the data. Yes, if we start with certain services that helps in getting people to this web. It's a federation of relevant existing and future data sources, basically a virtual space where producers and consumers of data meet. And again, data is the whole spectrum of things of the fair digital objects. Open-ended, there's no reason why there should be a limited size because it's a federated system like a World Wide Web. 
and meeting, of course, all the European requirements. And if we speed up in Europe, we might be ahead of the private sector, which is not easy because they are going to develop this also. If we don't put money into this, if we don't do an effort, it's going to be there anyway. It's unstoppable, this development. But it's better if we do it for the public sector ourselves. Uh, and then we can meet all the European uh, uh, data requirements. And as I said, it's a worldwide system, thus in interaction with the rest of the world. How do I see the European Open Science Cloud? For me, it is a twin brother or a twin sister of what we call the e-infrastructures. The e-infrastructures see to it that we can store the data, that we can transport the data, that we can do calculations with the data. So it's computer facilities, it's internet connections, and it's storage. But the European Open Science Cloud is for me the data infrastructure, the services of data, the interoperability of data, and all the things that go with the data. One cannot live without the others. Therefore, I've made it a yin-yang picture. There is no use trying to make a data infrastructure if you have no e-infrastructure. And there is no use having an e-infrastructure with no data in it. If there's only zeros or one, it doesn't mean anything. So the two are inseparable. And it's therefore a yin-yang situation. What is the guiding principle for this European Open Science Cloud? The overarching principle is we do this for research. A lot of people say we do this for researchers. I deliberately say no, we do this for research. And that helps the researchers. Thus, this is very helpful for the researchers. We don't do it for the individuals. We do it for the work the individuals do. We do it for having faster, better possibilities with research. And thus, you could say we do it for the researchers, but I, I like to emphasize we do it for research. It's multi-stakeholder. As I said, we need a federated system. Uh, so we will have to ensure that uh, all the let's say, steps, uh, all the components are in there. It's based on the fair principles, as I have explained. Uh, it's, based on, it's based on openness, as I said, as open as possible, as restricted as necessary, the federation of infrastructures. And an important aspect is this should be machine actionable. The data, in many cases, will and should stay where they are. We should not make a big data lake. And therefore, these you need machines to search the other machines, and data sets can be very large, and you cannot do that by hand. So if this is not machine actionable, it's also worthless. But from the beginning, we have to see to it that it's a machine actionable system. What is the history of the partnership the association has with the European Commission? We started with the initial governance in the years 2090-2020, so very recent, two expert groups. An expert group was, that was called the governance board, an expert group that was called the executive board, installed by the European Commission. Their task was mainly to develop and create the new governance for EOSC. And they came up with an AISBL, which is uh, an association based in Belgium, in this case in Brussels to be more exact, an international uh, association where parties could be a member. And this association has signed an MOU with the European Commission of almost 1 billion euro, 490 million euro in cash from the Commission in projects related to EOSC uh, and within the frame of the SRIA, which was mentioned by Jeanette before, and 409, uh, 500 million in kind from the members of the association over the period of this partnership. And this partnership will run until the end of 2030. We have started this week actually by discussing what will be the next step. What do we need after Horizon in Europe? Because if we need something else, then we should start today rather than start in 2025. It's an exciting journey. Uh, the milestone so far, there were four members that founded it. This is just technical. The members have no extra rights. These are just founding members. It was incorporated as an AISBL in uh, July 2020, obtained the royal degree in September. The first General Assembly was in the year 2020 when I was elected president and we elected a board of eight other board members. Uh, in the meantime, we've had four General Assemblies, the last one last May. It is mainly or almost exclusively, I could say, research performing organizations, research funding organizations, and service providing, research service providing organizations. Uh, uh, we have now more than 160 members and 75 observers, roughly with a ratio of 85% research performing, 8% service, uh, sorry, funding, and 43% uh, service providing. This is also the ratio you would find in Europe. So it's a, it's a good ratio of organizations. 
We have signed the co-programmed uh, partnership with the European Commission in the mid of 2021. And basically joining the association means joining the partnership, being involved in what uh, was mentioned by, before by Jeanette, developing this FRIA and developing this whole system. This is the distribution over Europe at this moment. I will not go into the details, but countries like Italy, Spain, and I think there was another one, uh, France, are, uh, let's say the biggest contributors in numbers. These, these are big countries, of course, so this is understandable. The partnership, as I said, what is the partnership and what is the mission of our European Open Science Cloud Association? The mission is to provide a single voice of advocacy representing the stakeholders, the research performing, research funding, service providing organizations. And this is to promote the alignment of what is done by the European Union in their funding and the alignment of what is done by the institutions, the national money and the European money uh, in order to bring that all aligned uh, with the Sharia. Sounds easy, it's extremely difficult to align 3000 parties in Europe uh, onto a common agenda, but we're making progress. And the ultimate goal, of course, is to have a, a seamless access of data through interoperability. This dream I had before is the ultimate goal we have with this association. The association is not EOSC. Maybe it's good to, to understand that EOSC is the system we're trying to create, we're developing, and the association is an organization that helps and that stimulates in developing that system. So I'm not the president of EOSC, I'm the president of the EOSC Association, and there's a distinct difference for me between EOSC and the EOSC Association. EOSC is not well defined, the association is very well defined. What is the content of the MOU? It is established between two partners, the Commission and the Association, and this is done because the number of partners in the association can thus change without changing the MOU. If the Commission would make an MOU with all the partners, it would have to change basically every week. Uh, by the way, we uh, invite this, what is called the steering board. This is a representation of the countries in all our partnership board meetings so that the countries are on board in all the things we do, in all the decisions we take, in all the de developments we choose. It's a contractual arrangement. It's an MOU, so it's not legally binding. If the commission ultimately does not what it promised, we cannot change them, uh, charge them uh, and, and uh, send lawyers. The same way, the other way around, of course, if, if, if the uh, members of the association do not really do what they have promised. Uh, with an expected financial and in-kind contributions by the partners and with well-defined KPIs, which we have defined together with the European uh, Commission. The governance is the partnership board, and in this partnership board, there's, of course, the commission and us, and there we invite the uh, steering board, which is a representation of the member states. The uh, activities and the commitments of the committee uh, of the Commission are basically that they will align their programs with the Sharia. So we, together with all the stakeholders, define the, the agenda. Of course, the Commission itself is also a stakeholder. So we're now at this moment working on what is called the MAR, the multi-annual roadmap for the years 23, 24. And there we are di discussing with the Commission whether this is in line with their view as well. Uh, but it's all the stakeholders that make the, uh, the, the Sharia, the, and in this case, the MAR, the multi-annual roadmap. Uh, and the Commission has promised in this MOU that they will take into account, and I must admit they do this, uh, the advice and the suggestions coming from the association in order to build uh, their programs. And they will contribute through the work programs. We will contribute by a in-kind contribution as well to the Horizon Europe projects itself, uh, but also, of course, through our own activities. And if you look at the activities of the institutions, this is in financial terms, if you would translate it by far the largest. And if you look at the contribution from the countries, this is the second, and the commission is the smallest, actually. This is because a lot of work is being done already with data stewards, with open access, with all the work being done in your libraries and in your universities that we could figure under, under this heading. Um, this... Uh, work done by the institutions is, of course, usually paid by taxpayers' money, so ultimately also paid by the countries, if you want to. We should not forget that. Uh, it's based on openness, transparency, and dissemination, of course, and we have to do too much, as far as I'm concerned, monitoring and reporting. But yeah, it's a European system. What do you want? 
We have established 13 task forces into what are, we call five advisory groups. The five advisory groups are not an extra layer. They are just a combination of task forces, and they're also there to make it more flexible for the board of the association to start new task forces in an existing advisory group because the General Assembly decides on the advisory groups. The advisory group on implementation of EOSC has three task forces, rules of participation and compliance monitor monitoring with respect to these rules. Then the PID policy and implementation and researcher engagement and adoption. There's two board members that are the liaison with, that, uh, with those task forces, Suzanne Dumouchel and uh, Sara Garavelli. Then there's the technical challenges on EOS, the technical interoperability, the infrastructure for quality uh, research software, and uh, uh, important one, AAI, in order to get this uh, machine actionable system. Ignacio Blanquer is the liaison person from the board. Sarah Jones is the liaison person for metadata and data quality. So there we have the semantic interoperability, semantic interoperability sorry, and the fair metrics and data quality. Then uh, Willem Wittbach is the liaison person for the uh, advisory group on research careers and curricula. There we uh, try to combine all the knowledge. These, these advisory groups, by the way, are not there to create new uh, approaches. Yeah, of course, if something is evidently that we could do better, but they are mainly there to uh, uh, gather together what all the projects financed by the European Commission, all the other activities in the world is bringing into the domain in order to evaluate this as being part of EOS or not. Data stewardship, uh, stewardship and curricular development, uh, research careers and upskilling of countries, their ability to join uh, EOS properly and sustaining EOS. There we have Bob Jones as a liaison person. Uh, it's called funding models. Uh, you could call it business models. You could call it sustainability in financial terms. Whatever, uh, what we have, what I just said before, also we have started thinking on what is the more overall governance model we would need for the uh, long term, but also long term data preservation, which might, uh, let's say, also address you as libraries is an important item. There. What are the tasks for the association? These are the main tasks to develop and govern a federating core. Therefore, a core procurement is being launched later this year by the European Commission. The process has already started to manage the AAI. And if I say manage, it doesn't mean that the association is doing all that work themselves to have the AAI managed and to see to it that it's done according to the development lines we are, we are setting out. Same for the PID policies and the compliance network for the people that bring data, for the people that use data, for the people that serve data. And ultimately we have to sort of manage a trusted core trusted certification system. Next to that, we do outreach to stakeholders and we are a representation of the stakeholders, monitor the services and transactions that take place in uh, the system, part of it for the commission, part of it necessary as itself. We manage the EOSC trade for mark, therefore we have created a new logo for EOSC. Some of you may have heard that and have seen that. In the very near future, this will be the website and all the other places in order to make a distinction between the logo everybody is using and claiming to be part of EOSC, which it creates a very confusing situation. You type in EOSC in Google, the first thing you get is the EOSC portal. That's not EOSC, that's the EOSC portal. And that confusion is continuing to exist for a long time still, and we are working on trying to get that confusion out of the way. Uh, and of course, to contribute to the Horizon Europe uh, uh, policy and the program, because that's where a lot of financing comes from. What are the grand challenges in order to do this? Well, there's technical challenges, uh, the thing like the interoperability, and especially if you make it multidisciplinary, interoperability within certain disciplines exist. Astronomers are far, the high energy physicists are far, in the medical uh, domain we are getting further, but interoperability between the disciplines, the astronomers cannot uh, exchange their data with the high energy physicists because they live in silos. And what we need is, of course, ultimately interoperability over the whole spectrum. And it starts with interoperability within a discipline, then to the neighboring disciplines, and ultimately, and therefore I talk about 20 years, over the whole spectrum. And the second is, uh, if we want to do this, we have to uh, have an optimal authentication authorization infrastructure. 
suppose theoretically we would have a, a completely optimal authentication and uh, authorization infrastructure then safety would not be a problem anymore they don't exist in an optimal format it's never every, anything is perfect but if we would have a perfect ai we would have theoretically solved a lot of problems again this is theory this is only a direction not a real life existing situation we are stepwise growing into this operability interoperability as i said more difficult are the social uh, limitations or the challenges uh, we have getting the noses in the same direction i thought i, I talked to you about about 3000 organizations well it depends on how you count but that's the order of magnitude and getting those looking in the same directions the countries the european commission the organizations involved is not easy and combining the different levels local regional uh, level and by regional i mean europe is a region the united states is a region asia is a region that's what i mean by regions to a global convergence onto an open science commons is ultimately what we would like to do we talk to these regions we have discussions we try to get them in the same direction as we are in my opinion and i'm biased uh, but the european open science cloud is ahead of the developments in the other region yes in other regions you can find beautiful developments that are far but not region-wide and that's the difference in europe we have a region-wide development uh, which is going on what are the implementation steps uh, as i mentioned several times the interoperability framework which is essential in order to meet the fair principles uh, we are currently defining a minimum meta metadata model there are many metadata models and we sort of have to have a minimum and the possible combination of that a crosswalk uh, therefore uh, we need a clear publicly uh, available definitions of all the concepts the metadata the data schemes and the challenge is that not all the communities even apply these standards that's what you can see with the COVID-19 and with the pandemic there a lot of money has been put into combining data and this has been very successful for the biological data the genetics data the virology data the biochemistry data they are sort of combinable because they are similar standards but we were not able to combine this with the clinical data coming from the clinics therefore we do not have a medicine while we do have vaccines and uh, this development has a lot to do with the interoperability of data and the standards supply we need repositories for the semantic artifacts and mapping across these uh, repositories the aim for metadata and measurements to be machine it says readable should be actionable uh, as i said before and sufficient local compute power to handle requests what we will see is more and more data will be visited rather than sent and if the data are visited then locally the compute power should be there in order to do what you are allowed to do with the local data sets we have been recently working on the multi-annual roadmap which is part of the innovation uh, research and innovation agenda this shria this uh, research and innovation agenda defines uh, the framework for research and the developments uh, the multi-annual roadmap sets the steps for the next uh, coming years uh, at, at three different levels local uh, national and european level and there's three phases uh, the one we which is running at the moment 21 22 the one we have just developing uh, just developing 23 24 and then we still have to define whether we have 25 separately and then again two years or three years in one go for the last multi-annual roadmap of horizon europe program as i said it will not stop there what is the structure according to the SRIA, we have three main objectives and that is also the way we have structured this multi-annual roadmap make open science the new normal adopt standards and tools and establish a sustainable and federated infrastructure this is a, a short version of a longer text of the objectives the three main objectives we have for this overall system we have grouped the priorities in that mar uh, which has been sent out to our members but will be sent out again in the version we agree on with the commission uh, to the european national and institutional level and the outcomes are then listed uh, as uh, under each objective clarification tax etc we have done a consultation process in march and if we look at the result of that 534 uh, results came in uh, from that consultation in europe most of them from organizations some of them from individuals but mostly people representing an organization they want us to say more about the value proposition that sounds easy but it's not done so easy if we don't have an eos we don't have a value and we have to create eos jointly so we have to create the value jointly so i always say 
Don't ask what EOS can do for you, ask what you can do for EOS, rather than telling you what the value proposition is. If you pay into the contribution, you're not gonna get the same money back. It doesn't work that way. You cannot have the financial people checking whether this is worthwhile. You have to have the people that know about the content to check and determine whether it's worthwhile to join this party. The terminology is confusing. What is the core? What is exchange? What is onboarding? What is the federation, et cetera? Uh, so we can make that clearer extended text in multilingualism. Uh, this is coming up more and more. Europe, luckily enough, is a country of multi-languages and that has extra efforts and extra problems, but also its charm. And uh, if we can do, uh, cross those barriers, that helps enormously. Uh, several concerns were raised about how all this will be funded. Well, don't ask me, uh, let's fund it together. I already said most of the money is already in the system. I usually say if uh, rectors or other people from universities tell me, well, I need now these data stewards, who's gonna pay for them? I said, well, instead of having your 21st PhD student, you have a data steward, it's simple. Well, it is simple in the long run uh, because the money for science is not gonna be larger because we call it open science. Countries put a certain sum of money into their science and with that money, we have to do the things we need to do. And if we think we can do it smarter by having the data, treat it in another way, we should do that rather than complain about having no, more money. Of course, in the transition phase, if we want to reach this new way of doing science earlier, faster, money helps enormously. So I'm not against having extra money. I'm always stimulating to have extra money, but don't forget in the long run, this has to be paid by the system itself. We have to place more emphasis on the national investments and the national roles, the funding models, a priority, same story. Questions about the roles of the research software engineers versus the data stewards. Still a lot of confusion in our terminology, but we should start explaining that more clearly. Data stewards can be people that do research software engineering that are at the level of the department uh, or are at the level of the library or the university or in a national level. So this is a broad term. Uh, like researchers. Researchers, you also do not define what a researcher is, can be a PhD student up until a full professor. A data steward can also be a whole range of things. Minor points to check on the implementation, we did that. Agreed priorities for the next uh, uh, period in 23-24. Technical, the core, and there is already steps taken, and the onboarding procedures, interoperability and data search in line with what I've said before, and data quality. Data quality is something that came up only relatively recently, the last couple of years, but a very important thing. If something is part of EOSC in the future, it doesn't mean that it has high quality. It's the same as with standards. If something uh, complies with all the standards in a country, let's say the NEN standards in the Netherlands or the ISO standards internationally, still can be garbage. It doesn't mean that the quality is ensured by having the standards there. The involvement of the member states, an important one, we work hard on that, the funding and the resourcing models and the skills uh, with respect to the recognition and reward systems. If we do not have the right skills and if the people that do this work uh, and also the researchers do not get rewards slash recognition for this work on data, it's not gonna help. Quality of research, the, ex uh, the objective is to explore what is the most relevant quality dimension and that is, of course, dependent on the disciplines and the communities we're talking to. And then a possible approach is measurements and contacts, uh, measures and contacts, depending on the defined uh, communities and quality attributes uh, added to the data. And to identify the uh, common measures to align them with the FAIR principles. FAIR principles, again, do not say anything about the quality of the data the FAIR principles work on. Research libraries, now we come to the core of the story. Uh, I think research libraries are key players in this transition to what we call the new normal, to what we call open science. In my own university in 2010, when I started hiring data stewards, not me personally, but I asked to hire data stewards, eight, one per faculty at that time, growing to 38, one per department, I linked them to the library. The result with open access and the research libraries is clear. The research libraries have played a major role in what we now call open access. Not finished, but a lot of work has been done there. I think more university libraries could or should be involved in, let's say, creating fair digital objects. The whole development of fair digital objects, fair data, 
if I abbreviate it, is an important content-wise development libraries can and should play a role in. For this, they need involvement in data stewardship and the skills and training development. And this is what you see with a lot of libraries, to, that they give training, that they are involved in data stewardship, and I think that is exactly a part of their role. Historically, uh, they have close links to the researchers, closer, in my view, at least in the Netherlands, with the universities than the ICT departments have. Still, you see some of the university governance bodies giving this to the ICT department rather than to the libraries. And therefore, I think the libraries should make a closer link to the e-infrastructures. If the e-infrastructures are not coming to the libraries, uh, Moses is not coming to the mountain, the mountain should come to Moses. And uh, I think that is what needs to be done, a close relationship between the e-infrastructures in a uh, research uh, environment in a university, for example, and the libraries. And I think they should position them, uh, in their position, they can support the research communities with standards, developments, and skills. Uh, this is in line with the work they've always been doing, in line with the content of the work they, you do, I should say, because you are the libraries. You set up some recommendations uh, for the libraries. I looked at those. This was from workshops last year done by, by Liber. And basically, most of the points raised here were in line with the points I have raised. You can look at it later on. But you also set up, set up some recommendations for EOSC. And did we look at that? And did we follow them? And most of them. We uh, uh, have a clear advocacy program by now, and it's getting clearer and clearer. Uh, we uh, gather the stakeholders together. We are a representation of the, the stakeholders. We have a closer and more intimate dialogue going on every day. It's growing. We are only in existence for a little bit more than a year. And the first person hired in the association was in October or November 2021. Don't forget that we are just, uh, sorry, 2020. Don't forget that we are just uh, starting. A little bit more, no, 2021. Just more than a year. Uh, the national representatives, I have mentioned that several times, uh, equitable access, yeah, that, that is EOSC itself, that's not so much the association, so there we, I think, should talk. Uh, this is a recommendation to the association, but this should be a recommendation to EOSC itself. Of course, we try to find the best talent, and we are working on competence centers. I know the situation in the Netherlands very well, but also in Germany and other countries, more and more data or digital competence centers are locally with the research institutions or nationally uh, thematic. We are setting up three thematic data competence centers in the Netherlands uh, nationally. Service agreements, only if the thing are there, again, a requirement I would say for EOSC rather than the association, but the association has to look after it. We have a lot of events, maybe sometimes too many, and uh, hopefully we will show leadership. If you look at EOSC in a wider contents, you could see it uh, as part of the data spaces and something separate, but I'd rather use the picture the European Commission makes. They see EOSC as a data space underlining and uh, uh, supporting all the other data spaces. All these data spaces in certain domains, like say health, energy, or, or mobility, need research. They have research. And the research should also be part of the EOSC data space. So EOSC is hopefully in the long run going to combine research and innovation wise these data spaces. This will be then the basis for the science and research and innovation in the data spaces. Finally, if you look at EOSC at a global stage, I've mentioned it several times, we are talking to organizations like CoData, GoFair, RDA, but we all, uh, uh, and the, the uh, World Data uh, System, Already now, service providers from everywhere can be part of the system as they comply with the rules of participation. Already now, everybody from the whole world can be an observer in the association. So linking with other places is not uh, too difficult, but driving these conversions, which I mentioned before, is what we need to do in the long run. And therefore we have to talk to these regions. Not so easy, because who is representing the United States? Who is representing Asia? These are not easy discussions uh, in order to simply uh, have two people talk together and thus it is done. If I keep on dreaming, I come back to my dream in the beginning, then in 2040, roughly 20 years from now, a little bit less, I hope that 50% of the relevant research data, data publications, software again, would be as fair as possible. Then my dream would come true. As fair as possible means as fair as possible at that moment in time, because these principles are developing. So we're not talking about as fair as possible today, no, as fair as possible in 2040. 
And if I say relevant research data, it's the researchers that determine what is relevant and not we as an organization that determine what is relevant. And uh, we have to simply do this worldwide, of course. Uh, as I said, it's of no use doing it only for Europe. Researchers do not limit themselves to the European system. So in other words, when I would have been, I would say, or will be able to find with a few clicks, the diffusion coefficient of water as a function of temperature and as a function of water concentration in the different compositions of gelatin I'm interested in, then I will be able to predict the drying behavior of that material under different conditions in different scales in different experimental or production setups of drying equipment using the computer program we my phd students have developed and this would save a lot of energy and effort if that would have been possible 15 percent of the energy consumption worldwide at that time when we were doing this research was used for drying drying takes a lot of research uh, energy sorry and uh, imagine what you could have saved if this would have been possible and uh, hopefully, thanks to EOSC, this will be possible in the future. Let's co-create EOSC, I would say. Thank you.